Very excited to have a special guest speaker with us who we'll have an introduction of in just a minute. If you're outside getting coffee, we invite you to come in and join us for the forum this morning. We are tremendously excited to have poet and activist Sonia Renee Taylor here with us today. And this has been long anticipated for myself and others who know of her work. And some of you in the congregation who've read her book were so uh, honored to have this opportunity together. I'm going to actually turn it over to one of our members, Bethany Johnson, who has been instrumental in helping connect us with Sonia's work and also in helping uh, find a way for Sonia to be here with us this week. So without further ado, Bethany, will you come? Good morning, everyone. Pardon my voice. I have the distinct pleasure and honor this morning of introducing you to Sonia Renee Taylor. She is the radical CEO of The Body is Not an Apology. She encourages hundreds of thousands of people online and through her online communities every day. Um, But I think more important for us this morning, we see the ways that um, Sonia is a theologian but also a prophet. And what has been so important to me about her work is the way that it has given me the space to more deeply examine the complicated relationship I have with my own body and others' bodies and to understand the way that that's informed by the power hierarchy that we have in our society. So I'm so, so excited to have her here. It is such an honor, and I can't wait to hear what she has to say. Please help me welcoming her. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Wonderful. I am um, really excited to be here and a little bit nervous, uh, which I think is a good thing. I think that always means, like, you're invested. You care about a thing, and I do uh, care about the opportunity to be here and share my ideas today. Here's what feels really important to me in this in this space is that this become a conversation and not a lecture about bodies, because that's not exciting to me. Uh, And I'm a firm believer that whatever we should do should be mutually exciting to us. And so um, I'm really uh, wanting to create in this time that we have together, sort of oftentimes the structure goes like, I talk at you and then we have a QA. and a And what I would much rather do is just have us be in the dialogue as part of the format of this conversation. So what I think I'm going to do is read a little bit about, of the book. I don't know how many, raise your hand if you've already read The Body is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love. Awesome. So most of you are completely unfamiliar with this work, which will be super exciting. And I know your church is selling it. So hopefully after this, you'll be inclined to pick up a copy. Um, and then and then I'll open the floor for us to discuss the idea. Like one of the things that I think is great about sort of author talks in that way is that generally when you're at home and you're reading a book that is, you know, nonfiction and someone's proposing some way of being in the world, you're reading it and you're like, oh, that's okay. I like that. Mm-hmm. That feels resonant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is that? Mm -mm. You know, and depending on how offended you've become by the content, it becomes a coaster. The book then becomes like the place where you put your coffee, right? Uh, (laughs) And so what I love about having the opportunity to speak with people is that we get to challenge the ideas in real time. Like, as I'm sharing the idea with you, you get to, like, lean into and get present to, "Mm, but what about that? Or, yeah, Sonia, I see that, but I don't see this. Uh, and then we get to unpack those ideas in real time together. So that's, that is my vision for our time together. Does that work for everyone else? Awesome, because I'm also into consent. Uh, and so I'm glad that we all consent to that. Um, before we do that, I'm going to give a little bit of background about who I am and what it is that I do exactly <laughs> before I sort of launch into this. Uh, so my name is Sonia Renee Taylor. I am the founder and radical executive officer of The Body is Not an Apology. My favorite thing about making a company is that you get to make up your own title about what it is you'd like to be called. Uh, and so radical executive officer definitely became that for me. Uh, <laughs> And we'll even we'll talk a little bit more about why I use the word radical so often and in so many of the spaces that I use the word radical. Uh, but The Body is Not an Apology is a digital media and education company. This mic is on, so I don't need this one, right? Awesome. Then I'm going to get from in behind here and get closer to y'all. Um, 
So The Body is Not an Apology is a digital media and education company that explores the intersection of body, identity, and social justice issues. Um, essentially, we believe that inequity and injustice and oppression in so many ways are a result of our inability to make peace with the body, our own bodies and other people's bodies. Um, and when we really start to think about what oppression looks like, racism, ageism, homophobia, transphobia, fatphobia, we're actually talking about whose bodies we decide are okay and whose bodies we've decided are not okay. And then we've built a world that validates that system of hierarchy around bodies. And so our work at The Body is Not an Apology is to figure out how we dismantle that system of hierarchy around bodies from the inside out. Because systems didn't magically appear, they didn't sprout up from the ground, humans made them. And humans made them based off of a set of beliefs and ideas about their own bodies and about their own bodies' relationships to other bodies. And so, as we begin to explore that relationship that we have with our own bodies, where we have bought into that system, bought into the system about what is a good body and what is not a good body, what is a right body and what is a wrong body, as we explore how we are invested in that system, we can consciously divest personally, and then we become part of a collective body of divestment, which actually creates a new world, a changed world, a world that I like to call a world of radical self-love, which is sort of what it is that at least is my goal. Um, so today, The Body is Not an Apology. Like I said, we're a digital media uh, company. Our content has reached, I don't know, 3 million, 4 million people, lots of folks. Um, two years ago, I got to write a book where I'm naked on the cover, which is very exciting, uh, <laughs> or unnerving if you're my father in Barnes & Noble. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, I got to sort of spend that time detailing what is this idea that I'm talking about uh, and how is it that we get to practice this in our everyday lives and practice it with each other. Uh, and so today, The Body is Not an Apology is this international organization and movement and company. The book is sold in like 50,000, 60,000 copies. It's, we're doing all right. I live in New Zealand today as part of a a uh, three-year fellowship for social impact change makers in the world, all as a result of like trying to figure out how you scale radical self-love around the world. So it's been pretty cool watching this idea take off and watching people sort of try it on for themselves. And that, I think, is really where the work starts, is that the first thing I'm asking you to do is to just try it on, right? Like to just be like, hmm, all right, well, let's see what that feels like. What does this new idea feel like in practice? And from that place, be in the process of exploration. Cool? So um, is it okay if I give you a little story time? I'm going to read to you a little bit about sort of where we started this work and, and why. Uh, and I arrived here to you all today because your pastor and the lovely Bethany did a podcast uh, where they talked about the book. Um, and... By the magic of Googling yourself, <laughs> you can find out such things. I Googled, I was Googling my name, and the podcast came up. And I was like, oh, it's a whole series about my book. I'm going to listen to this podcast. And I was so impressed by the conversation and how it just really felt like they got what it was I was trying to say. Um, and so I think I emailed Bethany and was just like, I want you to know that this was really awesome. And then Bethany was like, oh, my gosh, how did you even hear that? <laughs> and so through this fantastic sort of moment of digital serendipity, uh, we found each other to, um, to, to be in this conversation. So thank you all for thank you all for using the work in that way. So this part is through the prologue of the book. And um, this is sort of, I think, the first place where I try to tell you what I think radical self-love is and why, yeah, like what do I think radical self-love is? And so it opens this way. I recently listened to famed author and spiritual teacher Marianne Williamson share a talk on relationships. In it, she described the principle of natural intelligence. She posited, an acorn does not have to say, I intend to become an oak tree. Every, uh, 
natural intelligence intends that every living thing become the highest form of itself and designs us accordingly. In a single sentence, all in me that felt nameless was named. We have a dictionary full of terms describing our interpretation of natural intelligence. Sometimes we call it purpose, other times destiny. And although I agree with the spirit of those terms, I believe they fail to encapsulate the fullness of what Marion Williamson's acorn example illustrates. Both purpose and destiny allude to a place we might, with enough effort, someday arrive. We belabor ourselves with all the things we must do to fulfill our purpose or live out our destiny. Contrary to purpose, natural intelligence does not require we do anything to achieve it. Natural intelligence imbues us with all we need at this exact moment to manifest the highest form of ourselves. And we don't have to figure out how to get to it. We arrived on this planet with the source material already present. I am by no means, oh, I thought that was mine. (laughs) It could be, though. It is mine. Uh, (laughs) And it's a reminder that my partner asked me to take a selfie with you, Bethany. So, uh, so my phone. (laughs) So, let's not forget to do that since I disrupted this whole conversation with that notification. Um, All right. So, (laughs) I am by no means implying that the work you may have done up to this point has been useless. (laughs) To the contrary, I applaud whatever labor you have undertaken that has gotten you thus far. Survival is damn hard. Each of us has traversed a gauntlet of traumas, shames, and fears to be where we are today, wherever that is. Each day we wake to a planet full of social, political, and economic obstructions that siphon our energy and diminish our sense of self. Consequently, tapping into this natural intelligence often feels nearly impossible. Humans, unfortunately, make being human exceptionally hard for each other. But I assure you, the work we have done or will do is not about acquiring some way of being that we currently lack. The work is to crumble the barriers of injustice and shame leveled against us so that we might access what we have always been. Because we will, if unobstructed, inevitably grow into the purpose for which we were created, our own unique version of that oak tree. I have my own name for natural intelligence. I call it radical self-love. Radical self-love was the force that canoned the words, your body is not an apology, out of my mouth, directed toward a friend, but ultimately barreling into my own chest and then into the hearts of hundreds and thousands of people around the world. Evangelizing radical self-love is the transformative foundation of how we make peace with our bodies, make peace with the bodies of others, and ultimately change the world is my highest calling. Coincidence after seeming coincidence has made that much evident. I don't know what your highest calling is. It's possible you don't quite know yet either. That's perfect. At this very second, a trembling acorn is plummeting from a branch, clueless as to why. And it doesn't need to know why to fulfill its calling. It just needs us to get out of its way. Radical self-love is an engine inside you, driving you to make your calling manifest. It is the exhaustion you feel every time the whispers of self-loathing, body shame, or doubt skulk through your brain. It is the contrary impulse that made you open this book or come to this talk today. An action driven by a force so much larger than the voice of doubt, and yet sometimes so much more difficult to attain. Radical self-love is not a destination you are trying to get to. It is who you already are, and it is already working tirelessly to guide your life. The question is, how can you listen to it more distinctly more often, even over the blaring of constant body shame? How can you allow it to change your relationship with your body and your world, and how can that change ripple throughout the entire planet? We know that the answer has always been love. The question is, how do we stop forgetting the answer so that we can get on with living our highest, most radically unapologetic lives. This book is my most sincere effort to help us all answer that. So, um, so, and I think this is what I found fascinating about this conversation that you all had on the podcast, which I don't think 
maybe it was a conscious awareness, but I was like, oh, radical self-love is how do I listen to the God in me? Radical self-love is if, if I am created by the divine, right, then the divine is inherently guiding me. So what's this other thing I'm listening to? And how do I turn that down so that I can hear this more clearly? All right? Uh, and so that, I believe, is ultimately what it is that I mean when I'm talking about radical self-love. Right? And I'm saying it in a way that allows a lot of other people to be able to access that. You don't have to understand God as a theological being to understand that there's something that is in us that desires us to be our highest selves, and then there's a whole lot of stuff outside of us that keeps us from being that, right? And so that feels to me like the, the start of the work, the start of the work. The other thing that feels important to mention is that when I'm talking about radical self-love, we use the lens of the body because everybody has one. <laughs> because if you're going to do this particular journey on this particular spinning rock, you got to do it in a body as far as we know, right? <laughs> uh, and so, one, it is the great equalizer in that way. It would be the great equalizer if we would stop trying to stick it in a hierarchy, right? And that even when oppression and injustice doesn't happen on the body, all, or even when it's not about the body, it happens on the body. All oppression is experienced on the body. Even when you're talking about climate change. Actually, what we're really talking about is humans' ability to continue to live on this planet in bodies, <laughs> right? Or will we become extinct because we have raised the temperatures of the planet so high that our bodies can't live here, right? Um, I'm, I, I love when people are like, save the planet. I think it's the funniest thing in the world to say. Because I just am like, the planet is going to evict us. <laughs> the planet's going to be fine. <laughs> it's going to evict us and start again with a species that treats it better. Uh, so, right, if it, you know, saving the planet is not the issue that we're really working with. The question is, how do we save us on the planet, right? So these are the kinds of things that, that we're talking about with radical self-love. And the idea, again, of the body, I do not think of the body as only the corporeal body. So the work that we do is also about the spirit body. Right? It's also about the body uh, as we understand the mind. Right? Um, so it is both physical and spiritual and intellectual. It is all of those. Whatever it is that makes up a us, it's all of that. It's all of that. Does anybody have you, what sort of what ideas or things start to come to mind in this conversation about radical self-love in the body? Yes. Or since it's a handheld, can I just pass it around? Or okay. Well, we don't want you to yell. <laughs> then you'll have a sore throat later. <laughs> I was born with my dad's body, which was a strong German stocky body. Mm. My brother was born with my mother's body which had long, slender legs and beautiful, curly black hair. Mm. I had the stringy blonde hair. And I hated that mm. for probably half of my life mm. until I have survived three deaths. I, this body has brought me through hell and back. Mm. And so I am totally grateful yeah. to my dad and to my body. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, we can applaud that. It feels like an absolute thing to applaud. And it feels, you know, I think so one of the things that we all have, right, is our own assessment about whether or not the body we got was a good one or what parts of that body are good and what parts of that body are not good, right? So if my hair is stringy. And one of the things that we talk about in The Body is Not an Apology is that the work of radical self-love is what we like to call a thinking, doing, being process. So the first step to de-indoctrinating ourselves from <clears throat> this system of body shame that tells us 
whatever it is that it wants us to believe about our bodies, is to start asking ourselves questions about the ideas that we have, right? So where did the word, why, why is my hair considered stringy? And why is stringy bad, right? And who told me stringy was bad? And why did I believe them, <laughs> right? Like those questions start to make the distinction between what I was told to believe versus what is true, right? And once we can actually make the distinction between what I was told to believe and what is true, then we can actually give what I was told to believe back to whoever it is that gave it to us, <laughs> right? Like I call it an ugly shame sweater you got for Christmas, but did you have a gift receipt for it? You can take that back. You don't have to keep it. You totally don't have to keep it. Did you have a question? Yeah. At the beginning, you mentioned the, this idea of just, like, trying it on and yeah. seeing how it feels. And I've found that a lot of times what it feels like is intense discomfort. Mm. And even recently, I was asked to just name some things I like about my body. And the amount of squirming and sweating I did, like, I did not like that mm. assignment. And I'm curious where you think that discomfort stems from and also how we can use that discomfort in a more productive way to actually encourage us on this journey of radical self-love? Absolutely. Great question. That was a juicy question. Um, so the thing I say, all the t- I say all the time, I say it to myself, I say it to people constantly, is nothing grows without discomfort. Nothing. Like, you know, like, the, I'm sure the bud doesn't feel great cracking through the soil, you know, this hard clay ground to come up and get, like, that doesn't look like that feels good, you know? Literally, when the caterpillar goes into chrysalis, it becomes goo, like sludge, (laughs) and then becomes a butterfly, (laughs) right? These are not comfortable states. Um, And I think that part of the problem is that we have equated um, that there's a way in which we have adopted comfort over growth, right? And, and what radical self-love proposes is that whatever our highest purpose is asking us to be in the world demands growth, right? The acorn can't stay an acorn, but it doesn't have to do a whole bunch of stuff to do it. It just needs us to get out of its way so that that which is inside can start to move and operate. So I think the first thing is to expect discomfort and to... And that what discomfort means is that it's your growing edge. It's the thing where the other side of it is a new level. So when you get there, lean into it. It actually, and so in the book I call this the act of being fear facing. And fear facingness is not pretending that fear doesn't exist. Fear is a very natural and important response in our beings. I don't roll up on cobras because (laughs) <laughs> there's a very reasonable fear <laughs> that it might kill me, right? <laughs> Appropriate response to the cobra. Um, however, not all fear means danger. And that is the distinction that fear facingness allows us to step into. I actually turn toward my fear, and then I assess, am I actually in danger Or is fear the response of the unknown, which I call fog, right? And fog is scary. You know, you can't see through it. You're like, ah, what would happen if all the things I've lived my life believing about this body aren't true, right? Oh, then that means I'm, like, responsible for my life in a different kind of way, right? Ooh, that's uncomfortable, right? (laughs) Um, But fog is just fog. It's penetrable. And on the other side is almost always clearing, right? And so fear facing this allows you to look at that and then choose to move through it. Yeah. An observation. Yeah. I've been in church 82 years. It seems to me the church is one of the guiltiest parties when it comes to teaching us to hate our bodies. Yeah, yeah. How did we get it so wrong, and how do we get back on the right track? Mm, Yeah. So I'm only going to give a little bit about that because that's my sermon today. Uh, (laughs) 
Um, but I absolutely agree with you. And so the question, so I think that there are, again, places to start asking some questions. Like, what role, what does the church gain by having me hate my body? Right? If we lit, just be in that exploration, because that's going to give you a lot of answers, right? What does the church as an institution and this is, I think, the, the thing that's very important. The Body is Not an Apology talks about, we talk about individual and personal transformation, and actually not even individual transfer. We talk about personal transformation as an act, as the foundational act of interrupting systemic and structural oppression. So be clear, radical, I'm, radical self-love, I am not here today because I'm altruistic and I just deeply want you to love yourself. That's, I do. But because it, it, because I have some investment in that. And my investment in that is not just like, cause I'm nice. It's actually not cause I'm nice at all. It's because your lack of self-love is in my way. It's because your lack of self-love helps to perpetuate the institutions of oppression that harm my body. And so I need you to love yourself so you can get out of my way so that my acorn can sprout. Right? And so the institution, the structure or system of the church is in the way of radical self-love for some reasons, right? And the question is, we've got to start exploring what are those reasons? What is the investment in a system of bodily hierarchy, you know? And we can look at the structure of the church as a system and start seeing that, right? Patriarchy, right? The ability for certain people in certain bodies to really maintain power over a very long period of time. Power also resource, right? Um, And so the more that we self-select that somehow we're not good enough, the less likely we are to mess with that stuff over there. It's a great way to keep you out of power's business. All right? And so power gets to operate unobstructed because you are over here worried about your 10 pounds. Right. Or worried about, you know, your graying hair or your aging body or whether or not you're as smart as the younger person or whatever particular orientation of message about your body lives in the world. And so interrogating that system of church, right, the system of church and in what in that system of church um, is served by our bodily shame is a great place to start that inquiry. And we'll talk a little, and I'll talk a little bit more about it um, from a sort of, you know, some of the biblical stuff that I see operating in that during the sermon. Rochambeau. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about where um, the bodily shame crosses what I would call sort of the health imperative. Mm-hmm. So it isn't that I disapprove of you because you're fat, yeah. but it means that so your heart's healthy. bad and you're not taking yeah. care of yourself mm-hmm. and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, totally. So the first thing that I say to that is you don't owe anybody your health. But it's in a private, but that's what I think is hilarious. In a private system where it already costs a bazillion dollars, right? So this is one of those interesting ways where, again, let's look at what the structure gains from that narrative. What the system of personal, of uh, privatized health care gains from the narrative, right? So there's a system that actually works really well to say, oh, no, we charge you more because you weigh more, right? And, and because that's unhealthy, Right? But if you actually start to go and look at the studies and who sponsors the studies that create, first of all, only correlation, not causality. None of these stories say fatness causes anything. These studies say fatness is correlated with dot, 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 dot. And then often, whatever dot, 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 dot is, is funded by a very large private institution that sells medicine for dot, 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 dot. Right? So these are not, again, none of these things are, are not related to system and power structures, right? to power and profit. But beyond that, 
I will start with my original premises, which is we don't owe anybody our help. Period. I don't owe you my help. I don't owe you. You don't have $5 on my funeral when I go. I don't owe you anything. Right? You are not about to pitch in, <laughs> which is just the truth, right? But even beyond that is the continual assumption that weight is, a, is some definitive example of health is rooted in fat phobia, which is rooted in a history of white supremacy. There's a great book out right now called Fearing, Fearing the Fat Body by Sabrina Strings, and it's the history of fat phobia and race and their relationship, uh, their relationship historically. And so what really Sabrina Strings tells us in this book is that our impetus around health, our narrative of fatness as a health issue, happened to validate the notion of uh, large bodies as problematic very specifically in relationship to the chattel slave trade. So as white bodies began to see black bodies, which were shaped differently, um, then using that actually coupled with some historical Christian doctrine, right? Those two things together created a narrative of the larger bob body as problematic. And then, then the medical industry began to tailor content to meet the social belief. The medical belief didn't start first. The social belief started first out of racial bias and religious doctrine, and then society followed suit. Society's institutions decided to back that up because there were power and profit in that narrative. So those are the kinds of things you have to start poking holes in when people bring it to you. But I start from, you don't have $5 on my uh, funeral, so mind your business. Right. And unless we're like slapping cheeseburgers out of people's hands at restaurants and like tackling jaywalkers, you don't care about health. Right. Like that's like, if you haven't tackled a jaywalker today because of their because <laughs> their life is in danger, <laughs> then you, this is probably not a conversation about health. It's probably a conversation about fat phobia. Yeah. Cool. Um, my name's Mary. And you're going to have to talk like twice as loud. My name is Mary. Hi, Mary. It's, I don't know if it's on is the issue. Um, I can talk loud. Um, yes. Yeah. I was just give him give him a second. Oh, okay. Uh, is this one working? <laughs> um, my question was just, what do you think about the narrative of body neutrality versus um, body positivity? Yeah. Totally. So the question was, what do I think about the narrative between body neutrality and body positivity? And so, and, and I see, I, it's a conversation I've been having with myself a while. I actually got asked uh, to review an article about body neutrality for a scholarly journal last week. And I found myself being like, mm, I don't know. Uh, and so... <laughs> Here, so here, I feel like those things live in a section of the book that I talk about, which is about self-acceptance, because I think that that's kind of, I, I see body neutrality and self-acceptance as very similar, sort of kind of a, the same ilk, um, which is like, no, nah, I don't have to love myself, I just have to be like, I'm not even, you know, like, I'm cool, either way, right? Like that kind of sort of neutral, and I have a body, right? That's kind of where that is. I have a body. And I think that there is usefulness in that, particularly in a world that infuses us with body shame on such a consistent and aggressive basis that every single day we are berated with messages that tell us that we should hate our beings and hate our bodies, right? And so if you manage to swim to the Isle of Neutral, hats off, <laughs> right? Because you have to go through a lot of sharks to get there, right? However... Neutral does not transform the world. And because the work that I'm interested in is transforming the systems and structures that created the sea of sharks you had to swim through, that neutral ain't going to get us there. 
which is the reason why I use the word radical self-love and why I don't use the word body positivity. Because I mean the radical part. Because radical in its definition means existing at the root or the root of a thing. It means existing inherently in a thing. It means serving as the foundation of a thing. It means proposing thoroughgoing and drastic um, efforts. And it means drastic political, economic, and social reform. Those are literally the five definitions of radical. And I believe that I'm interested, first of all, I believe that self-love is your inherent state. You arrived here on the planet as love. If I am created in the image of God and God is love, then I am love. Right? You've never seen a self-loathing toddler. <laughs> never. Never. You've never seen a toddler who's like, I just hate my thighs. <laughs> never going to happen. Never, ever, ever going to happen. Right? Because we come here in right relationship with our bodies and in right relationship with the bodies of others. We think they're amazing. We think they're beautiful. We think that your squishy knees and my squishy knees and your cool skin and my cool skin and my bald head and your bald head are awesome. Right? And so somewhere, <laughs> yes, <laughs> somewhere that message gets lost, right? Because that's not how we arrive. So first of all, we came here existing inherently from a state of love. I'm interested in a love that changes the political, economic, and social structures of this world so that all bodies have the ability to live and thrive unobstructed towards their highest purpose, right? Neutrality doesn't get me there because the world has never been neutral to my fat, black, queer body. The opposite of hate isn't neutral. The opposite of hate is love. And so what I need is a world that can radically love, love in a way that transforms systems and structures, love in a way that creates a new foundation upon what we build our systems and structures on. And um, body positivity is one of those, well, I mean, as soon as somebody is trying to sell you body positivity, you know that it isn't radical. If there's a commercial for it, it's not radical. <laughs> Like, that's your barometer. Like, oh, is this going to change the world? No, because you just saw five commercials for it. It's not going to change the world. It's going to make a lot of money. Right? And so ideas, movements get co-opted and then watered down so that they can be consumed under a capitalist structure. Neutrality doesn't diffuse that. And so a radical love, I believe, is how we start to transform that. Until I love myself so deeply that it is absurd to me that we exist in a structure that would ever try to deny me my rights, then I nev we never collectively actually try to disrupt that. And that's what it is that we need. We need the kind of force that a radical love creates in order to tear down those systems. So, yeah, thanks for that. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we're, um, I'm with you on all of this. Um, one thing I'm struggling with is about um, loved ones that mm. influence us uh, probably the most uh, positively and negatively. Yeah. And um, I can understand these structures, uh, you know, that are sort of divorced from this relationship situation that we're all in with our loved ones. But, um, like, you know, they may be looking at, at me look, thinking, you know, they love me very much. Therefore, yeah. they want me to look this way or do this, you know, mm -hmm. be this way or have these healthy, you know, kind of attributes. Yeah. Um, probably they're influenced by society and this economic, you know, mm -hmm. incentive that you're talking about, too. But anyway, can you talk a little bit about how loved ones um, interact with this philosophy or this thought? Absolutely. So yeah. um, the first thing I'm going to do yeah. is take your probably off of that statement. Okay. They are absolutely, yeah. <laughs> the messages that they are giving you yeah. are the messages that the world has given them. That's what I was thinking. Right? Yes. Yeah. And that right. all of us. So in the book, I use the example of speaking French. And so I'm going to share this with you all right now. So if you grew up in a French, let's say you're a little baby, and you grew up to some French parents, right? And your parents said little thing, coochie, coochie, wee, wee to you when you were a baby, right? And... 
as you got older, you know, all the all the information that you were receiving was in French. Um, and this is before, you know, like you haven't gone to school yet. You're not watching TV yet. You are absorbing the world, though, in French. And then as you get older, people start to give you resources and ideas and other narratives and other people start speaking it to you as well. And then before you know it, you speak really great French, right? You didn't have to do a bunch other than just be immersed in a world that speaks French, right? And then if you decided you didn't want to speak French anymore, I just, I want to learn a new language. You would have to actually work really hard to do that, right? You would have to intentionally learn. You would have to read books and study and do all of these things to start acquiring that language. And you would still think in French. And sometimes you'd still be like, wee oui, wee, oui, oops, I mean, yeah, like whatever, right? <laughs> all of that would still happen. And so we grew up, all of us, immersed in a world of body shame and what I call body terrorism. And body terrorism is the language that I use to talk about the systems and structures that are lethal to different bodies, right? All of us, all of us have been in an immersion school of body shame and body terrorism. All of us. And you're not a bad person for being in an immersion school of body. You didn't make the school, but you've been in it. But once you learn that that is a default language that you speak, what, what I start saying is the judge of character is whether or not you choose to intentionally stay in that language. That is the part that I feel like is an issue of character. So our families have been in the same immersion school we've been in. And the message is, and so as we start to learn a new language, they're not going to understand that language because they're not learning it. So they're going to be like, what are you talking about? We, 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 we yes, huh? Right? <laughs> and so we will sound foreign to them as we begin to awaken to these ideas. But what is beautiful is that you can learn new languages, and they can too. And depending on the way in which you present the idea of a new language, it can be a really exciting journey, right? Or it can be like something that people don't feel like doing, right? And either way it goes, that doesn't... Um, it doesn't absolve you from the work of knowing a new language now that you know the one you have is harmful. And so I tell people all the time that part of the assignment is to remind your family that they too also got this language, right? Like, hey, guess what I realized? We've been in an immersion school, <laughs> and I'm learning some new words. Can I share them with you, right? Not from a place of judgment, because part of what happens is we all of a sudden become very judgy to the people who haven't started learning the new language, even though we just learned yesterday that we were had a new language. <laughs> but now all of a sudden we're superior and righteous because we speak something new, right? You got three words of, of Mandarin and now you're an expert, right? <laughs> when really the work is the, to be in your humility and say, hey, I'm learning this new thing um, because the old thing was harmful, harmful to me. Here are how some of those messages you gave me were harmful to me. Here's how I spread them and made it harmful for others. And I'm really invested in divesting from that. And I totally would love you to be part of that with me. That's a loving and yummy invitation. I think that's the one we can make to our families. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. My name is Maya. Um, as I was sitting here listening to you talk, and even your title of The Body is Not an Apology, I began to think about how many times I've had to apologize for my body. Mm -hmm. And I thought about where did this come from? And I think back to when I was even younger, and my mother would keep my hair in pigtails and bows mm. for many years because she knew when I walked into a room, particularly where my body was the other, mm -hmm. I automatically have to apologize because when you see me, the thoughts that mm -hmm. come through your mind. Mm -hmm. And so I think about, you know, throughout the years of how, thinking of as a black woman, I think about how we've had movements of my black is beautiful and we're going to wear our natural hair, we're going to rock our braids, we're going to do that. But then I think about how because, like you said, it becomes something foreign, it's mm -hmm. the unknown, then others may imitate it mm -hmm. because, oh, I want to be accepting. And then you become the exotic. Mm -hmm. 
And it's Which tiring being the exotic. Exactly. I'm tired of being the exotic mm-hmm. sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. And so I guess what I'm thinking about is just historically, you know, I get my mother where she's coming from and, you know, and the ways bodies have been abused mm-hmm. and sometimes we've seen as older because yeah. we're built a little different at mm-hmm. a younger age. But I guess my question becomes this radical love, like I can love myself all day and I do. But yeah. when you get tired of being the exotic or yeah. being tired of having to explain mm-hmm. why my hair looks like this or yeah. please don't touch my hair or, you know, whatever. Yeah. But you get tired of just even walking in a room and knowing that the first glance, seeing in people's eyes what's going through their mind. Yeah. And so I guess my thought, and it could just be me venting in a moment, <laughs> or my question could be, you know, putting that radical love in practical ways. Yeah. How does that look when yeah. you get into those scenes? And, I mean, I know how I work right. on it, but I think about my two daughters I'm raising. How do you instill that in them? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I do in the back of this book um, is I give what I call 10 tools to radical self-love. It's the practical, everyday applications of this. How do I start to actually enact this in my own life? But I think even more to the question that you are talking about, which is, like, I love myself, and every day got to go out into a world that treats me like I'm something other than that, Right. And how is it that I continue to be embodied in this radical self-love when I'm exhausted from having to hold all of that other stuff out there? And the thing that I have, that I have done that is part of my practice around that, um, there are two things. So one is the good word boundaries. Um, and I love this uh, activist named uh, uh, Prentice Hemphill says, boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and love me at the same time. Whatever that space is, that's, that's, my, that's boundaries, right? And so part of that is when I'm enacting, in, enacting operating in spaces that feel incredibly harmful to me energetically, um, then I start to figure out how I orient my life to lessen that. And that's a, and that's a um, absolutely there's a certain level of privilege that exists in that to an extent. But I'm a firm believer that the first thought you have is, I'm doing this. And then the rest of it starts to become clear about the how. Right? That, that if I decide that I'm beholden to a world of prejudice, then I'm beholden to a world of prejudice. If I decide I'm not, that doesn't mean the world of prejudice magically disappears. But what it does mean is that some new doors magically appear. Some new potential ways of navigating that. The other piece about it is, is that when I'm in my radical self-love, I'm less concerned about your gaze. I'm less concerned about what the white gaze means on my black body because I'm not thinking about you. Because my identity is no longer tied up in a system of comparison to the hierarchy of the white body to my body. What radical self-love does is it returns us to a sense of autonomy about our own identity and being. And once my identity and being is no longer in comparison or my radical self-love exists regardless of what you do, how you show up, who you decide to be in the world, all of a sudden how you do and who you decide to be in the world has less energetic impact on me. It still has material impact. It still means I got to navigate, I still have to navigate racism and white supremacy. Um, but But racism and white supremacy don't get to take up all my space. Right? I no longer center whiteness as the way in which I orient my world. You know? And so sometimes that means I'm like, oh, I can't. I actually need a space that is just for people of color right now. And I create those spaces for myself. Right? And then sometimes it means like, I'm not answering that question for you. Right? And sometimes it means um, a really firm, if you do not remove your hands from my hair, I'm going to hurt you. Right. And all of those things become things that I now actually have the power because I'm not like, how do I put the bows in my hair so that so that I, you know, so that I don't disrupt this space? You know? Yeah. So, thanks. Absolutely. Uh, so it's interesting you talking about the whole like <coughs> uh, uh, fat phobia, fat shaming related mm-hmm. to the efforts, collective efforts with chattel slavery to dehumanize and differentiate slaves from people in order to make it seem morally uh, acceptable to people who were Christian. And um, so, but I guess what my question here is, is 
um, with the difference between like black and white bodies and the difference between other types of bodies, do you believe that there is a meaningful, like significant, once you get past all the, the social structures that have been built up over the years, do you believe that there is a meaningful, significant difference between like black and white bodies or uh, bodies that have been socially differentiated? Mm -hmm. Um, do you believe that past those social differentiations, there is a, a meaningful, important difference between bodies that that even uh, matters on, on a um, physical level? Yeah, um, okay. Um, I think my, my, my answer to that, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to I want to make sure I'm actually answering the question that you're asking. So, be, actually, what I mean to say is, I don't know if we can do the thing you, you're trying to do in the question, which is pull bodies out of the social construct in which they right, exist or were right. created in. Yeah. That's what it is, right? And so we can't make what has made us go away, right? Mm -hmm. Even if the systems all went away, right. there's still the ingredients. Right. You know, like I could clean up the kitchen. That doesn't change the fact that I put eggs in the cake. Because the shells aren't there anymore, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and so the differences that have been created as a result of in this moment, in this, in, this, in this context that I can actually see, and I think that this is a different thing than when I talk about um, what I like to refer to as the liberatory imagination, the world we cannot see yet. Right. right? The, wor the world where one day my identity as blackness may not matter. Right. Or your identity as whiteness may have no meaning, right? That these labels and constructions that were created get to fall away, may fall away, because the context in which they were made no longer makes sense. I believe that that could be a possibility. I also hedge on the desire for it in a moment right now where we have, where we barely want to acknowledge the structures that created those labels in the first place. Yeah. Right? So there's this, urge, I feel, sometimes for us to move towards this story of colorblindness, right? This world where race doesn't exist and we're all just one people. Um, and oftentimes it's just to skip all this stuff in the middle. More often than not at this point, it's to skip this stuff in the middle. And so what we do with the body is not an apology to interrupt that, is to say, if you start from being a difference celebrating people, then all manner of difference becomes a thing that you actually look for and are excited about. Yeah. So rather than looking for sameness as the way in which to build relationship, we look for difference and welcome it as the way to build relationship, to build richer, more diverse, more vibrant human relationship with one another. And so I think that right now I'm more interested in a world that is so wildly different celebrating that every time something looks the same in a room, they're like, mm -mm, we messing up. This all looks the same. <laughs> Because right? if we started doing that in boardrooms, our corporate entities would look wildly different. If we did that every Sunday, our churches would look wildly different. The world would look different if we started looking for difference. Right. Yeah. And so that's, that's where I think we need to start. Right. That, that makes sense because, you know, like the, the idea of – first of all, I, I should be clear. Like I've, I've heard people – you know, say things like, I don't see color. And right. it's kind of like, you don't, because it's right in front of you. I mean, oh, right. even if it's a social, <laughs> yeah, even if it's a social construct, it, right. it's still there. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I guess it's kind of a, a fantasy to imagine a world where, like, you know, people aren't going to look at me differently because I have a red beard. You know, right. people aren't going to look at somebody differently because they have blue eyes. There are other differences that don't mean anything simply because they never, there was never an important reason for them to mean anything. Right. And, I mean, so, but I guess it's, I guess what you're saying is, like, it's better right now because we have to acknowledge these things to right. acknowledge them in a positive way. Exactly. The goal yeah. is not to remove difference. The goal is to remove the meaning we have made out of difference. Okay. That's the goal. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, first of all, um, thank you for being here and sharing, mm -hmm. um, you know, all this with us. Um, so I entered the world in a male body mm -hmm. and I've been socialized to you know accept myself as I am mm -hmm. I'm in a male body I don't care about um, hair on my legs and you know <laughs> all that <laughs> all those things yeah but um, 
I watched my um, sisters mm-hmm. and um, later my wife and my daughters having to contend with, you know, those things, fitting in and yeah. all that. So my question to you is, how does a male mm-hmm. who may be occupied a different wrong Mm-hmm. on this um, social ladder, mm-hmm. rightly or wrongly, that's yeah. the way it is. Um, so how do I help my sister, my daughter, my wife, mm-hmm. and, you know, deal with what the pressures that society put on the female body yeah. to, you know, to conform to whatever ideas, you know, they find acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Great question, because what I hear in that question is, how do I be in solidarity? How do I be a good ally to my sisters, right? And and, and what I think the first place in the work of radical self-love is, is to, if your sisters are having a different experience in the world as a result of their bodies than you are having, the examination is in that space in between. Why? do my sisters have a different experience and expectation on their bodies than what the world has given me? Because that's, that's called privilege. Oh, I have privilege. <laughs> that's what that awake, awakening is. It's like, oh, there are things I'm allowed access to or given or not demanded of me um, that other people aren't having that same experience. So, oh, that's a space of privilege that I hold. Well, why, what is happening that I've been given these privileges? What is the structure in the world that's allowing that privilege to exist? Right? Oh, why am I told that I don't have to care about my body and that, but that, or that I don't have to shave my legs? It's okay if I have hairy legs, but it's not okay if women have hairy legs. Oh, oh, because there is, because I live in a world that has valued women based on their appearance and their presumed femininity. Right? And so, and that obviously that's for somebody. Not for, and not for them, because they don't feel like shaving their legs, but they're told they have to. So who is that for? Who's left? Men. <laughs> That's, you know, so this process of deducing, right, gets you to start. And then from there, the assignment is to work in the world where you have privilege to start illuminating that reality to the other people you share privilege with. Because the way that that privilege operates is that everybody just agrees to have it. Everybody who has it just silently agrees to have it and they go on and they never challenge anybody or themselves about the privilege that they hold, right? So it's men's responsibility to start questioning these rules that their loved ones are forced to occupy amongst other men. Yeah, right? So be in that investigation for yourself and then spread it. I just want to say thank you for shining a light and bringing a voice to the concept that um, so many people can't articulate. Mm -hmm. um, Me personally feel like I check a lot of the boxes, feeling marginalized, feeling different. Physically, the color of my skin, my gender, all of those boxes for Mm -hmm. myself. Um, And you talk about in the book of you almost want to get to a point of finding your own little cave or zip code um, (laughs) where you get out of the government, get out of everything. Um, But I want to move forward. What would you say, and I know you give tools, what would you say, and maybe a piece of personal advice, or what moves you forward in that radical self-love? Loving myself, I I love myself. What would you say the biggest thing that we, you know, a a speck or a citizen in the world Mm -hmm. can move forward with that radical self-love, just pushing um, yeah, I, so I say in the book that, that the last two tools in the book are the most important, and I super duper mean it. Um, tool number nine is be in community, and tool number ten is give yourself some grace. Um, and so you cannot do this radical self-love journey alone at all. And so, and alone, doing it alone is a body terrorism paradigm. It is a system of oppression alone, individual, rugged individualism, meritocracy, all those things, system thinking. 
They are fantastic ideas for oppression. They are great for making sure that oppression stays totally in place. Because whatever's happening to you is just your individual fault. It's just your failure. Right? And so community, by virtue of its very existence, begins to disrupt that system thinking. Right? And so, and because you can't be an entire system alone. Right? Like, as soon as we think that this radical, this radical self-love work just becomes body positivity and some other watered-down thing when we're trying to do it alone, because you, movements don't happen alone. Movements happen in community. Movements that disrupt power structures happen in the collective. So in order to be in a radical self-love practice that is sustainable, we have to be in the collective. So find your people. Right? Um, and then the most important one, the most, most, most important one is to give yourself some grace. That this is not a destination. I have arrived at the, the summit of radical self-love and never again did I ever have a negative thought about myself. And now I am forever in love with all things about the miraculousness of me. Which, which feels nice, <laughs> but is not real, right? That as long as this work is about unpeeling the layers of shame that have been given to me, there's, that are given to me every single day. Every time I interact with anything, that layer is trying to stick itself back on me. It's exhausting and it's hard. There are days I run an entire organization dedicated solely to radical self-love and there are days I don't feel very loving toward myself. And on those days, I love the Sonya that doesn't feel very loving to Sonya until Sonya loves herself again. I love you, Sonya, who's struggling today. I love you, Sonya, who doesn't feel good enough. I love you, Sonya, who thinks you're not ever going to get it. I love you. And the more that I practice that loving, the more I'm able to return to that anchor of radical self-love. So, yeah. Thank you all so much. It's been great. Thanks for letting me talk to you. Appreciate you.